I'm Dale Falwell. I'm a certified public accountant. I'm the current treasurer of North Carolina, uh, who has had a career with a third of my life as a blue collar worker, making my living with my hands and my back and my feet. Uh, a third of my life as a white collar uh, a worker and then the last third as a public servant. Uh, my reputation is that I attack problems uh, and not people and, and try to uh, be in loyalty, loyal and exercise a duty of care to those that teach, uh, protect and otherwise serve. Uh, some folks think the treasurer uh, may sign the $1 bill because that's where they most often see the word treasurer. Uh, actually, I don't sign the $1 bill, but we manage nearly 200 billion $1 bills and just the pension plan by itself is four times larger than the state budget. And it by itself is the 26th largest pool of public money in the world. And as, the, as I close uh, in answering your question, uh, at the end of the day, we're in the check delivery business. People do not call the treasurer's office to book a cruise. Uh, they call us because they've had a life-changing event. Uh, most good, some bad. And that's how our loyalty and duty of care, that's where it rests. So I want to begin by asking a question about uh, COVID-19, which is, has put a strain on state budgets and state pension funds, and North Carolina is in a good place. And I, and I want you to talk about why that is. How much is that to do with you? How much is it to do with the kind of structural strength of it that, that uh, preceded you? Uh, tell us what you think about that. Well, I'm standing on the shoulders of two groups of individuals, those that work in the investment management division who manage this, these pension plan funds, and also previous state treasurers who none of have pretended to have a crystal ball or, or gamble with the assets. If you look at the criteria that has been established for the last 50 years in the North Carolina retirement system, it's very easy to look at this chart and know that why our pension plan is one of the most safe and secure uh, in the United States. It's because we don't have a crystal ball. We don't gamble uh, with the hard earned uh, money of those that teach, uh, protect and serve. Uh, when the stock market goes roaring up, uh, because of our conservatism, uh, our uh, fund never goes quite, up quite as much as others. Uh, but obviously, when the market goes down like it has did right after St. Patrick's Day of this year, uh, we greatly outperform most pension plans, not just in the United States, but in the entire world. Because it all goes back to not assume rates of return and life expectancies and asset allocation, it goes back to delivering checks to those that teach, protect, and otherwise serve. That's our role at the treasurer's office. Uh, Ned, you have a question? Mr. Treasurer, you had, a, uh, you had a big dust up over the state health plan there. That didn't really end up the way you wanted it to do. Are you gonna revisit that issue or have you sort of resolved yourself that that's gonna be the status quo? Well, actually, uh, Ned, thank you for the question. There's no turning back. Uh, People of this state and this country are no longer going to accept having 20% of their income go towards something that they don't understand the price and the value of. Eight years ago, Bill Gates said the single biggest threat to public education, which is something that I know this editorial board takes very seriously, single biggest threat to public education is the way that states and local governments account and fund for the unfunded pension and healthcare liabilities of their communities. Warren Buffett said 15 months ago, the tapeworm on the US economy are rising healthcare costs. I'm probably the only candidate in the state who's actually lowered healthcare costs over the last four years. But it all, all starts with our clear pricing project. And it's the dust up, Ned, because nobody wants anyone to know what they're supposed to be paying for healthcare. This is the Freedom of Information document that I received back from UNC Healthcare when I was trying to figure out what our state employees were paying for health care at UNC Healthcare. I'm sure the News and Observer and the Charlotte Observer is very familiar with documents that look like this, fully redacted. They have said repeatedly that the state treasurer as their largest customer or anybody does not need to know what things actually cost. This is becoming an unbelievable burden. It's not just what the president is saying about transparent health care cost or Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, but the presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren said in the interviews back in February that rising health care costs are the leading cause of bankruptcies, especially among lower income and fixed income individuals. We have a lot of lower income folks who work for the state of North Carolina who are working one, two, and three jobs just to pay the family premium on the largest purchaser of health care in North Carolina. 
So we have 25,000 providers who have said yes to clear pricing. One of those providers, uh, Peter, is in Charlotte. That one provider has 140,000 lives. So it's not 25,000 lives, it's 25,000 providers. So Trine Medical, ECU Physicians, all those folks have said yes to clear pricing, get rid of secret contracts, push the power down, and most, most importantly, we increase the reimbursements for the first time in decades for those that are closest to the health and the well-being of our citizens, primary care doctors and mental health specialists. So contrary to the premise of your question, I'm very excited, very optimistic that if North Carolina can become known as the state with transparent health care cost, the Secretary of State's office will not be able to be open enough hours of the day to register all the companies who would like to come here and do business. And when companies come here, that means more people are insured. When more people are insured, that means more people who go to the doctor can pay their bill. When more people can pay their bill, the healthcare cost of everybody decreases. Well, the, the, uh, the response to that is that the rural hospitals rely on cost shifting in order to stay solvent. And if you don't let them cost shift, they're gonna, they're gonna go under. So you're not going to serve people if they don't have a hospital that's open. Well, the mathematical facts are actually a little bit different than what you just said. We have most of the rural hospitals in North Carolina under the clear pricing project stood to make more money, not less money. As a matter of fact, New Hanover Regional stood to make $4 million more per year in profit by disclosing what their prices were and going under the clear pricing project. So it's a myth to say that this was going to destroy rural hospitals because it's mathematically not true. Rural hospitals have their own challenges that have been brewing for about 25 or 30 years. These are situations I inherited. Let me tell you what I'm in favor of. I'm in favor of accessible, high quality, uh, affordable, and profitable independent healthcare in North Carolina. That's the only way that we're going to break the cartel is what's happening in North Carolina with the consolidation of healthcare into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Harvard, London School of Management have all said this, that when you have the further consolidation of healthcare in the arms and hands of fewer people, quality goes down, access goes down, prices go up. That's what we've been experiencing in North Carolina and that's what we're about to experience a lot more of going forward, which is disastrous for low income, fixed income people in this state. So what other role can you play in that besides the clear, clear pricing project? Well, there's no other role actually because we're the largest purchaser of healthcare and pharmaceutical benefits in the state. I mean, in light of rising healthcare costs, what we've been able to do over the last four years is we've been able to hold family premium steady for four years, even though our healthcare costs have been going up. Why does that matter to you folks? The reason it matters is that we have beginning teachers, beginning troopers, correction officers who have to work four, one week out of every four this year to pay the family premium associated with the largest purchaser of health care in North Carolina. That's absolutely inexcusable. So what we can do is we can lead, but get other people to accept the notion that if North Carolina becomes known as the state on the eastern seaboard that has transparent health care costs, it's going to drive an economic gold rush, the likes of which none of us have ever seen. Your opponent says that you've taken too much money out of the market, that you have too much money in cash. Looked good when COVID hit because you weren't in the market that heavily, but then you missed the big rise in the, uh, the stock market since, uh, since COVID came on. What's your response to that? Do you, do you want to have more money out of the market or in the market? Sure. Well, at the end of the day, we're in the check delivering business. I'm not going to use my valuable time on this editorial interview to address somebody who's never managed money or managed people or been involved in government in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, but regardless of where it comes from, is your what's your philosophy? Should you be in the market, or do you have want to have more cash in hand? Uh, the philosophy is very simple. Uh, we have a, a situ we've had a situation in North Carolina for the first time and nobody's reported on this. For the first time in North Carolina history over the last two years, the number of people paying into this pension plan are less than the people who aren't. McClatchy is very familiar with this, with your pension plan. You're also very familiar. Gosh, 
I bet somebody I couldn't make you laugh within 15 minutes of this interview, Ned. I'm glad I was able to do that. Uh, you've all heard about this with Social Security. You know, when we were growing up, it was 15 to 1, the number of people paying in versus the number of drawing. Now it's probably 2 or 3 to 1. For the first time in North Carolina history, this pension system, one of the biggest pools of public money in the world, has crossed the precipice of the number of people paying in the plan are less than the people who aren't. That doesn't mean everybody's retired and drawing. It's just the fact is that we get money from three sources. We get money from the employee who has been putting 6% of their salary in this pension plan for the whole time they worked at the local or the state level. And by the way, that 6% has not been changed in 50 years. We get money from the employer and that's from either the local governments or the state. This year, the state employer contribution is 15% of payroll. And then we get money from investment gains. How does that relate to your question? The way it relates is that it's great to have a discussion, a theoretical discussion about risk and return, but at some point you've got to look at the funders, like I was speaking to the county League of Municipalities Board of Directors this morning. I mean, the League of Municipalities in these cities and counties across North Carolina are, are facing tremendous headwinds as far as their ability to make payments of all types. This pension payment is 10% of their payroll. So you have to take into account not just risk and return, but you've got to take into account the General Assembly, the counties and the city's ability to keep funding the plan. Otherwise, you're not going to have the plan for the next generation of public service workers. And contrary to popular belief, I've always said that as long as I'm the state treasurer in North Carolina, I'm going to preserve, strengthen, and figure out how to sustain this public defined benefit pension plan for the next generation of public service workers. Well, when you ran, one of your big complaints was the, uh, the fees that were being paid to these uh, consultants on how to, uh, how to invest the pension fund. Mm -hmm. And I guess you cut a lot of those fees. Have you seen any impact of that in terms of your return, sort of losing that expertise? Well, uh, we'd have to have a whole nother Zoom about the fees, but I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, another example of over the last four years, when you look at the integrity, the competence, and the courage, and the things that it takes to actually be the keeper of the public purse, uh, we have cut, we've over, under promised and over delivered. We've cut um, almost $350 million in Wall Street fees. You know, many of these folks that had money that were managing it for us had underperformed indices. We now have over $50 billion of our money that's now being uh, managed internally, tracking right at the S&P at, at basis points that are almost incalculable, like 0.0001% uh, because we're doing it all internally. So we don't mind paying a fee when somebody's bringing value to our plan. But, but to give you one example, and I'm sometimes criticized about this by, by folks, is that getting into the details. When I first became the treasurer, I had a goal of calling 176 of our portfolio managers on 12 minute intervals. Who are you, where are you, how good are you, how much are you charging us? We paid one money manager last year, $146 million fee on a $200 million investment. Now that, that investment went up in value, but the fact is the fee had stacks and stacks and stacks of other types of hedge funds that were getting a fee on top of the fee. We cut $2.5 million in fees, a really small amount, from one money manager who was charging us one price on the second floor of our building in the pension plan and a different price on the first floor of our building in the 457 and 401k. We're not giving us the totality and the benefit of the North Carolina Treasury Department's relationship. So in many cases, this has been like an ain't eating a ham biscuit, uh, but uh, we're very pleased uh, with what's happening uh, on the fee basis because unlike a lot of things where you do good, anytime the fees are cut, that money stays in the plan for the benefit of current and next generation of public service workers. Dale, you came to this job as, after serving as head of the DES, right? Correct. And you, you got a lot of credit there because it built up a lot of funding and the big trust fund and all this. But then when the COVID thing hit, they said that the agency was kind of a mess, that the technology was backward, that it was underfunded, that it had inadequate staffing, and that there was this terrible backlog when as things came. Was, did you see that coming when you were administering that agency or did you, 
do you ask anybody to sort of improve the technology or the staffing in, in the event of some crisis? Uh, before I became the Assistant Secretary of Commerce in charge of the broken, broken unemployment system, uh, the state had been in a six-year RFP. And the request for bid for updating the technology at DES was 23,000 pages. And that had been in the works for six years just to get the contract signed. And it's called SCOOBY because it was a joint venture funded by the United States Department of Labor led by the state of South Carolina with us, Georgia and North Carolina. So my point of saying that to you, they had developed since I've been left DES, the Scooby system became live. It's, it, it was born before I became the Assistant Secretary of Commerce. It was sort of, uh, I don't really use the incorrect word, but it was sort of getting there while I was, and then it, it actually started getting worked on more after I left. Uh, I would say and defend a couple of things uh, about DES. Number one is that agency was hit with a tsunami and a volcano and an earthquake all at one time. Number two, when you say credit for cleaning up the system, this is not just about the amount of money that's in an unemployment trust fund. This is about doing it correctly and quickly. Now it may not mean much to folks on this call, but it means a lot to people across North Carolina. There's nothing worse than sending out an unemployment check to someone that you're gonna to have to collect it back from them at some point in the future. This agency, when I took over, had the lowest quality scores in the United States for the last 14 years behind Guam and Puerto Rico. Not just the 50 states, even behind Guam and Puerto Rico. So all the credit for reforming this agency, I can't address what happened in the legislature. I was not consulted about it. No one asked me about it. I didn't know anything about uh, a legislation. I was out of public office. I got, was asked to be the Assistant Secretary of Commerce on March 13th of 2013. And I can't address, well, I can address the fact that this trust fund has been built up because of employers paying in the trust fund because of increased payroll taxes to get the debt paid off. But what I can attest to is this, much of the credit for reforming the unemployment system of North Carolina, if I get a little bit choked up about this, then so be it, goes to the people who worked in this agency. 700 employees, many of whom had never been listened to for 10 years, who had phenomenal ideas of how to get this money to people both correctly and quickly. So a lot of the credit for working off the backlogs, getting the quality scores to number one in the nation and uh, building up, going from a deficit to a surplus, most all that credit, in my opinion, does not belong to me. It belongs to the people in that agency who had been there for long periods of time. If you just listen to them, you got fantastic results. Thank you. I'm sorry, does anyone else have any questions? Dale, thanks so much for joining us today. Let me give you a, a kind of a rundown of how things go from here. We are gonna be making our endorsements uh, beginning October 1st, running through October 15th. Um, and that, as you know, is when early voting starts. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the order is that we're going to be endorsing, but uh, obviously the Council of State Races are real important and, and we'll, be, we'll be getting to those for sure. Um, and I really appreciate you coming in today and joining us and answering our questions. Can I make a closing comment? Um, you may make a closing comment. I'd like to read from your words from four years ago from the Charlotte Observer. Capable candidates running for treasurer, but fall, we recommend Falwell, whose background and talents more directly prepare him for the job and whose vision is more on the point of what is needed at this point in our state's history. Uh, that's why he has won the endorsement, and again this year, of the State Employees Association, the uh, Firefighters and Paramedics Association, and other groups who have a direct state stake in the treasurer's office's performance. And in terms of the uh, News and Observer, uh, obviously that endorsement went a different way, but it's a fair point that a, the treasurer's office needs to address the attention of the unfunded pension and healthcare liabilities that are facing us. I wanna show you a chart here from former treasurer Harlan Bowles from 40 years ago. Little known unfunded healthcare liabilities are something that actuaries have not dealt with, but the retiree cost will soon equal, dwarf, and then greatly exceed. 
all the public liabilities of the state of North Carolina. This was written 40 years ago. So since these editorials were written four years ago, I've consistently, as it said in the editorial, approached this job with competence, judgment, integrity, and courage. And I've been the most, according to the national press the, and local press, I would say the most transparent treasurer in the United States and the most transparent public official in North Carolina. Uh, I'm the only person that anyone's ever heard of who has a one hour call once a month where any member of the international, national, or local press can ask me any question on any subject. And I don't pick and choose which people to call on and I don't tell them what questions to ask me. So if getting your endorsement is based on competency, judgment, integrity, and the courage to take on Wall Street, big healthcare, and big drug companies, then I think that I've earned your endorsement because I'm not just the treasurer once every four years. I'm the treasurer every day as keeper of the public's purse.